Hey everyone, welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and today I have cellist Laura Metcalf on the show. Laura has a thrilling and unique career as a touring chamber musician. Not only has she designed a career out of playing chamber music with several touring ensembles, one of which is called Boyd Meets Girl Duo, the guitar cello duo she has with her husband, she has recently started a concert series in her own city of New York called Gather NYC. I wanted to have her on the show not only to talk about her chamber music career, but also how she started a concert series, what her first steps were, and how it went during her inaugural season. If you've ever considered starting your own chamber music series, this episode is a must listen. Check out the show notes for more information about Laura, her ensembles, and Gather NYC. But before we get started, I'd like to thank Fix Music for being a sponsor of Crushing Classical Podcast. Fixmusic.com is your online resource for high quality sheet music at great prices. Check out their latest offerings like hard to get music and frequently backordered parts. Fix also offers unique solutions for teachers and schools buying music. Whether you have a large private teaching studio or you run a music program, Fix has a solution for you. Contact them through their website for more information. Fix now offers free shipping on all domestic orders. And remember to use the special discount link in the show notes and get 10% off your order. And Drone Tuner, an incredibly revolutionary tuner app, is now available in the Apple App Store. You may be thinking, another tuner app? Why do I need this one? Let me tell you why. Do you tune with a drone or a constant tone coming out of your tuner? Are you tired of that nasty mechanical sound? This app has samples of recorded live musicians for your drone work. It is such a pleasure to tune to a sound that is your exact instrument. Not only that, the visuals on this app are super fast and the reaction time is like no other tuner app on the market. You can tune intervals and chords within a key so you know if your major thirds are too sharp or just right. You can tune using vibrato if you play with vibrato, and you can even tune a chord with a friend. People are already in love with this app. Some things people are saying about Drone Tuner. Best app ever. I have never felt more comfortable playing in ensembles after using this app for just a few weeks. And I used the Drone Tuner to tune my college orchestra this morning. Worked great with the iPad 4. Check out our website, dronetunerapp.com, to see video tutorials on how the app works, or check out the videos in the app store. Drone Tuner is currently available on iOS for iPhone and iPad. Get yours today at the iTunes App Store. The link is in the show notes. Let's get started. Hey, Laura, how are you? Hello, I'm good. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for coming on Crushing Classical. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So, um, so Laura, you have so we're going to talk about all the things you do in your incredible entrepreneurial music career, but. The one thing I want to start with is the Gather NYC that you just started, the the concert series. It's so incredible. I've been following it on Facebook, and I'm just blown away by all the cool musicians you're getting to come awesome. in. It's Thank so you. great. Yeah. So tell me, what what is Gather NYC for the audience? So it's a weekly Sunday morning concert series, um, our our very first season that we've launched, and we're right about smack in the middle of it right now, um, goes for 13 weeks every Sunday morning at 1030 in the morning. Um, there are a series of hour-long concerts. Um, it's mostly music, but we also have storytelling, very short storytelling, um, little interludes. And we also have a celebration of silence in the middle of the concert just to get away from the noise of the city and our brains and all of that. Um, Prior to the concert, we serve uh, delicious coffee and home-baked pastries. And um, yeah, the whole thing is, is wrapped up before noon and you can go about your Sunday. And we just felt like it would be this really lovely thing to give to um, our city. That's so incredible. So how did you come up with the different um, facets of it, like the storytelling and the silence part? Like what, what inspired you for those? I mean, the music part seems obvious, especially as a musician, <laughs> but like how did you come up with the other ideas? What was so inspiring for that? I cannot take credit for these ideas. Um, <laughs> they, it was modeled on a series that is going strong in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, called Chatter ABQ, and they've been going for 10 years now. Um, and they do these concerts every week. They do 50 concerts a year. So they only wow. take two, two weeks off of the whole year. 
Um, and over the last decade, they've really built this very loyal following. Um, and I've been going out uh, to play there for many years now. And I, I was just always, every time I go to play there, I'm so floored by the sense of community that I feel there. Um, and it's unlike any other concert series I've ever played at. It's just, it, you feel like these people, you come back time after time and they remember you and they've, um, you know, they've sort of been with the series for a long time. And it's just this really lovely sort of gathering place um, for that community. Um, and it's really been my dream to start something similar in New York for many years. Um, we've made a couple of little changes and little adjustments just kind of based on the differences in where we are. But mm -hmm. pretty much um, they um, we do more storytelling in the middle of our concert, they do more poet. They usually have a poet mm -hmm. um, and stuff like that. But basically the concept is the same. And we hope that over time we can build a community like they have out there. That sounds incredible. How did you first initially get, um, I'm mean, find out about Chatter ABQ? Um, a really good friend of mine is one of the artistic directors um, and Gosh, I can't remember when my first concert out there was, but it was probably like seven, more than seven years ago. Um, he's a clarinetist. He's not actually based in Albuquerque anymore, but um, he invited me to play. And then just kind of, I go back like maybe between two and four times a year to do different chamber music and different um, configurations. And it's just been this really, really nice part of my life that has been really fulfilling and um, nourishing. Oh, I love that. And you know, it's one of the things I always talk about on my post and, and I think about a lot too, is what I love about it is you saw something that was already happening that you really loved and you decided to make it in your own city. So it's like not having to reinvent the wheel, but saying, I love this thing that already exists, but really far away. Can it exist? <laughs> you know, can it exist in my city? in its own version, you know, right. with my yeah. own spin on it. So that's so, I love it so much. So how did, how long did it take you to get from that place of, that's a dream that I want to fulfill in my own city in New York to our first concert is this coming Sunday? Like, how did you get <laughs> from those, from point A to point B there? Well, I think, I mean, like I said, the idea and the desire had been brewing for like more than a year. Okay. But, um, this venue, I think it's really all about venue, like especially in a place like New York, you have to have the right, right. home for something like this, because mm -hmm. if you don't, it's just, it's, it becomes an insurmountable, an insurmountable difficulty. So um, this venue, Subculture, it's um, a place that I've been connected with for a while. Um, the owner is a great friend of mine, and um, I've played there many times. And Rupert and I did a concert there uh, in the early fall of this past year in 2017. And um, after that concert, I just, after being there, I mean, I'd been there many times, but just at, for some reason after that concert, I was like, you know what, why don't we just do this here? Mm -hmm. And um, it's a really sort of intimate venue. It's welcoming. It doesn't feel stuffy at all. It's underground. There's a bar right in the performance area. Um, it's just, it's a really comfortable place to be, if, especially if you're not really used to classical music concerts. Yeah. So, um, so the first thing we did was pitch it to the owner of the venue to see if uh, he would be into it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, so that was about like early October and then um, everything kind of happened pretty quickly. We did fundraising. We did engagement of all the artists. Um, we did obviously sort of starting to get our branding up and running, graphic design. Everything happened between early October and March 11th was our first show. So, okay. Wow. That's yeah. pretty quick. So what was – when when you say fundraising, I mean – I'm getting ready to do something like that for something I'm doing here. And I'm going, okay, so what, what does a fundraiser look like? Do you, are you calling people on the phone and telling them about the project and asking for a donation or are you throwing an event? Like what, what are some of the things you did to fundraise? 
We, um, so for this inaugural season, we went with private donors. So we mm-hmm. pitched our idea to a number of private donors. Um, and, you know, it really required them to take a leap of faith yeah. and believe in the project. Um, and we were sort of just lucky enough to convince um, a handful of people to get behind this project. Were there people? Were they people that you already knew? Or yes, uh-huh. yes, everyone okay. we already knew had relationships with. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think um, going forward, we're going to have to expand and, you know, maybe explore doing, you know, fundraising events or a benefit of some kind. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think for us, we got really lucky for this first run to have people that believed in us and, you know, they, because we already had relationships with them, they knew they'd been following our careers already Mm. and they kind of knew who we are and what we're about. So, um, it wasn't just sort of cold calling or starting from scratch. So that was a real plus for us. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, that would, that would really be crucial having, having, so far, everyone that you've mentioned has been people that you've had um, relationships with for a while, you mm-hmm. know, starting from the venue owner to the first people who you asked to donate. So that's yes. really, that's really interesting. So did Absolutely. you have, did you have a target amount? Did you, did you think like, okay, we can't start unless we have this amount? Did you have a budget or did you just? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we made a budget. Um, so yeah, the first thing we did before we pitched anybody the project was make a budget um and we kind of separated it out to like the upfront costs like all the stuff that would have to happen before we even put on a single concert Mm -hmm. um you know pr graphic design website all that stuff um you know before we even sell a single ticket we need we need that money and then um a weekly cost of putting on each concert, which varies a little bit week to week, depending on the size of the ensemble. But, um, so yeah, we have like a weekly cost and a total budget for the whole 13 week season. Okay. Okay. So yeah, we had that kind of in the back of our minds, um, before we pitched anybody so that they understood like what we really needed. Right. And how is that from week to week? Is it overwhelming to go, Oh my gosh, (laughs) <laughs> I got to get to work on the next or is it is everything ironed out so that there's not a whole lot to do besides get the get the treats together or what what do you have to do each week before the next concert comes So honestly the absolute biggest challenge of this whole thing has been getting people to come to the concerts mm. um we kind of like everything else kind of fell into a bit of a rhythm after the first week or two um, you know, we have like a checklist of everything. It's, it's just Rupert and I, my husband and I running this thing kind of on our own. So, um, you know, we have a checklist of everything that we do every week, which is like collect the programs from the artists, um, and put it together in a, we have like a, a program that we got printed for the whole season. And then we do an insert every week. Okay. So we like create that at night. We organize a baker every week, um, and sometimes that involves going to pick up the, the baked goods the day before. Um, we write thank you cards to all the artists. We write the checks. We do we do all this stuff. We have this sort of like really sort of well-oiled checklist now. Mm. Um, but th- the thing that's really time-consuming throughout the week is we do our mass emails. Um, sometimes we do personal mass emails in addition to our Gather NYC mailing list. And we're constantly reaching out to friends and contacts um, individually and inviting them to the concert. It's just the, the, like the number one biggest challenge is just getting people to know about this and getting people to take a chance on something that's a little different than they normally do. It's earlier maybe than they're used to attending something. So, um, you know, the lion's share of our efforts during this season has been just just really kind of grassroots working mm. to spread the word. And yeah, I mean, we expected that we, we've been in this city for long enough to know that it's very hard to get people to 
get off their couch <laughs> and come see something. Yeah. So we expected this challenge, but it has definitely been a challenge for sure. Yeah. So so being that it's New York, that that presents exactly the challenge you just mentioned. And also um, the fact that you we had talked earlier about, I, I wanted to know, how did you get such amazing guests, you know? And I thought, how could they afford those people? Because I've been I've been watching them come through and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So tell me more about um, how you were able to get certain, um, I mean, everybody, they're, it, they're like, a lot of them are big name people, people that you know are traveling and, and presenting concerts all over the world. And, um, and a lot of them live in New York. So it's almost like, it's almost like a local feeling thing. So tell me a little bit more about, um, about your guests and how you were able to afford to get them. Sure. So, um, first of all, we, we don't have so far for this season, we didn't have any travel budget. So right off the bat, we knew that we had to ask people that live in New York. Uh -huh. um, so that was already kind of a you know, a limiting factor, but not really because it's New York. And right. So and so many people already live there that are so fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So then we just made a list of all the people that <clears throat> we admire and respect as artists and also that we have a personal connection to. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like you said, you're seeing a theme of like personal connection. You know, both Rupert and I have lived in the city and been musicians here for over 10 years and we've obviously developed a lot of personal relationships so we just started there we made lists of people that we we really loved and we would want to hear play um and just started contacting them and um you know telling them about the concept and about what we're trying to do mm -hmm. and almost everybody said yes like the only people that we asked to play that aren't playing on this season um, unless they were just being polite. It was <laughs> more just sort of conflict uh, schedule conflicts that mm -hmm. prevented them from playing our season. So it seems like all of the artists that we contacted um, were just really excited about the concept. It was a different thing for them. And um, you know, especially with, with touring artists and I am a touring artist myself. So I know this for a fact that, um, my, the concert fees that I receive to play concerts is way higher, are way higher anywhere but New York. So like mm. I make most of my money from touring elsewhere, playing not in New York. Okay. When I play in New York, it's more of a sort of a showcase. I, maybe I haven't played for my own hometown audience in a while. Um, I, I don't do concerts in New York to make money. I see. So, um, you know, obviously I'm not privy to the financial, you know, information for all of our, our artists, but I just know from my own experience that when I play in New York, it's more of just a sort of, you know, hey, hey, New York, hey, friends, hey, family, this is what I, what, this is what I've been doing. Right. Um, okay. And so I, I, I can't help but speculate that that's kind of how they all felt about it. Like this is this really cool thing. It's a chance to be a, some, a part of something that's pretty unique and potential has a potential for real growth. Um, and, and so, yeah, we were, we were just absolutely thrilled with the reaction from the artists that we approached. Um, and so far every single concert has just been unbelievable. The level of music making that's been happening at gather. Um, it's just really astounding and everybody all of the audience members have just been absolutely floored by the amount of talent that we've been able to to showcase yeah every week I'm blown away by who's coming next and I don't live in <laughs> New York and I'm like man we gotta get up there I mean <laughs> seriously it's so great so tell us some of the some of the people that have done concerts already um so our opening act was Laura St. John on violin and um, she, she, she set the bar really high because she came in. It was daylight savings. So oh, that's everyone rough. <laughs> had, everyone had lost an hour of sleep. Yeah. And she showed up and she was there like at 840, um, ready to sound check and like nailing these runs. She, she was preparing um, Symphony Espanol 
the Lalo at mm. the time um, for a performance a couple weeks later. And it was her first, she's a, she's a soloist. She plays concertos all the time, but it was her first time playing this concerto for some reason. Um, so she had programmed two movements of that piece. Um, she program in her program, she, she split them up and like played them at different times. Um, which, you know, in maybe a more traditional concert series would be a sort of weird choice, but for our purposes, it worked amazingly well and she absolutely nailed it. She did some solo Bach, which was just breathtaking. Mm. Um, and she ended up having her pianist that she played with, um, also plays accordion. So she finished with a short set of pieces, like these kind of folk pieces, like, um, like sort of klezmer type. Oh. Um, folky pieces with accordion and everybody was just absolutely like excited and like uplifted by these pieces and and yeah her concert was just a, an incredible way to start off the series um, and yeah and since then we had um, Project Trio who is an amazing um, sort of uh, yeah. alternative they're not really that classical they do their own arrangements of pieces um, and they did a concert and um, ended up, it ended up being a lot of kids in the audience. And they did this really family friendly, like fun set that everybody just was really excited about. Oh. Um, and uh, we had, oh, I brought in um, the, the guy I was mentioning, my good friend, James, who is one of the artistic directors of the Albuquerque series. I brought him here to New York um, to do some clarinet trios with me and another really amazing pianist um so we did a program of this really kind of probably the the most out there piece that's going to be played on this whole series this clarinet trio by magnus Lindbergh. Mm. um it was a little bit of taking a chance to see if people would be into it because it's it's new music it's definitely like there are moments that are sort of accessible and tonal but it's also like really gnarly in places <laughs> and I was like nervous if anyone was going to like it, but, um, and there were kids in that audience too. We've had families and children at every concert, which is great. And, um, the kids were like wrapped with this, with a tent in attention at this piece. And wow. it was really crazy to see that, um, it's, it's a pretty intense piece and there's a lot of, goes through a lot of shifting moods and characters and it's really exciting. So it's, you know, kids always yeah. seem to surprise you what they, what they're, what's going to get them going, you know? And I, I just love how not only the way that you describe it, it's really, it's really so great to think of a Sunday that, um, that people can go somewhere with their whole family, you know, cause a lot of times concerts are late. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm a parent and I'm going, the concert starts at eight. Uh, that's going to screw up bedtime. And then I'm going to pay for that tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like totally as far as and the kids moods and like, so yeah, that, and then just a way to set up your week is just, it seems so, so fantastic. So I wonder if you've gotten feedback like that for regarding the family thing. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody who's brought their kids for the most part has said like the kids really were into it. Um, we haven't had trouble with kids disrupting the concerts, really. That's good. Um, they've been really well behaved. Um, and, and yeah, like our, our, our dream really is to have these concerts be for everyone. Like mm -hmm. we want families and kids and people who have never been to a classical music yeah. concert before. And because we have such a high caliber of artists, we, we encourage you know, classical music enthusiasts and regulars to come check out the concerts as well in sort of a different setting than they're used to. So we really just want to have a welcoming, eclectic audience. Um, and so far, that's actually been happening, which is amazing. That sounds fantastic. And, you know, so I know about your connection, your recent connection with Airbnb, because I'm following you, by the way, everybody should follow Gather NYC on Facebook, because your posts <laughs> really um, explain everything that's going on there so well. So um, I think that's great that you guys got on Airbnb. I mean, how much has that helped you with your ticket sales so far? Um, it's helped a ton. So this came about um, through a friend of mine who they contacted him, Airbnb contacted him, to do, um, to do weekly concerts, but he doesn't like live close. He lives a little outside the city and it just wasn't really like, didn't really make sense for him. Mm -hmm. Um, but like 
he realized that it was probably pretty perfect for my project. So he directed the Airbnb people to me. Um, and that's how it kind of happened. Um, mm-hmm. This Airbnb concerts is part of their offering um, of experiences. So it's not um, it's not the same as their obviously their like home rental right. platform. But it's sort of an additional thing that they're they're offering is like, hey, while you're visiting New York, do this experience. And specifically, the concerts program is geared toward intimate concerts in places that tourists and visitors would never find. Mm -hmm. So none of the Airbnb events are happening at Lincoln Center or Carnegie Hall. They're all at kind of alternative um, secret secret ish venues. Um, yeah, because so, if you're on Airbnb, you're sort of looking for something alternative already. You know, like yeah, I'm looking for an alternative space. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's that vibe of something alternative, and you got to be in the know, or you got to know somebody to know somebody to know about this cool thing. So I like that it sort of gives it gives that vibe, and at the same time shows your concerts to people who just happen to be on the app. Yeah, already which has been cool, and we have seen people from all over the world like every every concert we get travelers like from different countries and Mm. from across like you know from the west coast and it's it's just really cool to see these people that you know they saw the thing on airbnb and they were like hey this looks cool and you know the other advantage is that new yorkers are so busy and their schedules are so intense and even like we thought you know, this is on Sunday morning, unless people are really religious and like going to church, they're not going to have, we're not going to be competing for people's time on a Sunday morning, like we would on a Saturday or a Friday night, right? But what we found is people, New Yorkers are so scheduled that often people have like a regular like yoga class that they go to on Sunday morning, or they take their kids to soccer, or like, there's, there's any number of conflicts that can arise with New Yorkers on their Sunday mornings, but with travelers, like their only agenda usually is to experience Mm -hmm. cool things. And so they're less um, scheduled and therefore more, I think, open to attending our events. So it's been, you know, I, I won't say that it's like we're selling out every week yet. It's not like we're flooded with ticket sales, but um, you know, the people that are coming, through Airbnb are people that we never would have been able to reach otherwise. And it's, it's been a really amazing partnership. That's incredible. And so is it easy to connect with somebody at Airbnb or is it on, you know, if say someone who's listening has a concert series or something they'd like to get on Airbnb or is it only in certain cities? Do you know that? Um, it's very, very new in New York. They started it, I think, in like London and San Francisco. So those um, networks are much more built up. Mm-hmm. But in New York, there's actually only under 20 concert hosts right now. So um, I think, I, you know, since they reached out to us, I don't really know um, right. what the procedure would be if somebody wanted to present an Airbnb concert themselves. But, um, you know, I think they're they're slowly building it up and they're, they're doing a lot of sort of quality control and vetting of the hosts. They had, they had to like approve our venue. Every time we want to put a photo up on our listing, we have to go through management. Like they're very careful about what they present and what they're offering. It's not just a sort of free for all, like you, you have a concert or you consider yourself a performer and you just put your stuff up on the app and have at it it's it's very they're they're very hands-on um a per, the person that I've been working with from Airbnb actually attended our concert the other oh, wow. day and we chit-chatted about you know strategies and stuff so they're they, they've been incredibly hands-on and incredibly helpful throughout the process so it's been really cool to work with them that's great and hopefully it will keep growing and spread you know around the country so people who are presenting concerts like yours or or in the classical world will be able to use it. You know? Yeah, I think that's their goal. They really want to take over. They're very ambitious with this this project. So <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if it started sort of cropping up everywhere very quickly. That's exciting. That's really cool. Um, so I know that next coming up, is it the next concert? Or I'm not sure if it, but I know it's one of the concerts coming up. You and your husband are playing together. Yes, we are. So we are the 
artistic directors of Gather, but we're also a duo called Boyd Meets Girl. Um, and we are ourselves are playing the next Gather, which is this coming Sunday. So we're really excited about that. That's so exciting. So what are you guys going to play? Um, we're going to play a mix of stuff. Um, some of it is from our album that we released in the summer of 2017, um, which is like a bunch of stuff that we arranged for ourselves and a couple things originally written for cello and guitar. Um, we've arranged a Beyonce song and a Michael Jackson song that we'll play. Um, and then we also have a guest artist, this really amazing singer named Joelle Lurie, and she's going to do a couple tunes with us as well. Oh, that's so cool. So that was something I wanted to ask you about, and I meant to ask you about it um, another time, but um, I'm just going to ask you now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you have the Beyonce song and the Michael Jackson song. Um, is there Are there rules about... Um, licensing or something where when you when you arrange an artist's music like that or is it totally new then when when it's your spin on it yeah so um so for the michael jackson it's actually on our cd so we had to purchase the mechanical license for that song Mm -hmm. um, which is basically like we paid a certain amount per cd that we made okay um that had that song on it so that the appropriate people get paid when when we sell the CD. Um, so and and with Beyonce, we're not. It's not monetized. It's just uh, exists as a cover on YouTube. Mm. Um, and with YouTube, you put you put something up, and it gets it's a standard YouTube license. Okay. And they find a way to filter it to the appropriate people. So um, if we were to if we were to sell the put the Beyonce on a CD and sell it, we would have to purchase the mechanical licensing for it. I see. So you can so you can play it on a concert and it's not a problem. Yeah. Okay. I'm kind of asking for myself here, because <laughs> <laughs> like, um, yeah, as I as I go on with my with my project and contempo, I'm like, um, yeah, there's stuff I don't know. Well, at least I have people right. to ask. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there's certain artists I think that are more picky about it, and certain composers that are more picky about it, mm-hmm. but. Um, you know, if, I think if you're covering like a major artist on a concert, you don't have to report to them every time you play it live. But if you're going to be selling the recording and making money, that's when you really have to be above board with it. That makes sense. So you and Rupert have been a, a musical duo for how long? Um, our first concert was in 2013, actually at Chatter ABQ in Albuquerque. Oh, cool. And, um, at that time it was more of just like a fun thing. We had started dating like, um, less than a year before that. And we were like, let's try to play stuff together. Why not? Um, and that concert happened. And then we did a tour of us, a short tour of Australia. Well, when I say short, it was like three weeks, (laughs) um, uh, a tour of Australia that fall, um, but that was before we were boy meets girl and like actually a, a real thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, over time we were like, this actually could really be a thing. And we got a name and we got all the stuff that you need. We started making videos. Um, and it just kind of grew organically from there. And we released this album last year and we did a huge tour. We played like probably 50 concerts over the course of 2017 to sort of promote the album um, and it's just been this really nice thing because we are both really busy with our other projects, like our separate projects that don't involve each other. And mm-hmm. with the tour schedule of like my, my own tour schedule with the different groups I play in and then his tour schedule, it was like, sometimes we would not see each other for like over a month sometimes. Wow. So it's been really nice to do stuff together and be able to tour together sometimes so yeah great. so when you did the Australia tour was you said you weren't like an official group but was that just like let's take a vacation and play some concerts or or were you um, like okay this is going to happen we're going to make this thing this a thing right now by doing a, a tour well Rupert's from Australia so almost okay. every year he goes back and plays concerts so he has this whole network of presenters that he knows and is has played for. Oh, okay. um, he's he's gone back and done like solo stuff with those presenters. He has a guitar duo that he goes to play with. So he's he is always bringing his projects back to Australia and doing um, concerts. So for that first tour, I think it was like ten concerts. And then um, when we did it, when we went back this past September. 
once we released the album, we did like 18 concerts um, and kind of got a little more into the like entire country. We went to every state and territory. So he was able to expand upon what we had built from our first tour to make our second tour even more extensive. So yeah, he, he like set that whole thing up, which is inc- an incredible amount of work. Yeah. But, um, you know, he, he's done it before, so it's not like a totally new thing for him. I see. Okay. That makes sense. So, um, so let's see, where do I want to go next? Well, what I want to find out first is, so you play cello and it's not typically the route that, that a cellist would go to be a touring musician, especially with a guitar or, you know, unusual group. So did you ever, as you were going through school, did you always know that you didn't want to do the, you know, the traditional route of orchestra or had you thought that you would do that at a certain point or like, where were you, where were you mentally for about your career as you went through school? Um, I think like in my undergrad, I was, I was just really focused on getting my playing to like the highest level that it could be. I, uh-huh. I honestly, and I, I definitely should have, but I honestly didn't think a lot about my career. I thought, I remember um, in my senior year of college, of undergrad, I was doing auditions for master's programs and I had this like ultimatum for myself. I auditioned at like, I can't remember how many schools, like five or six schools. And I was like, if I don't get into any of these, I'm not going to become a cellist because that sort of is going to tell me something. Mm -hmm. And maybe that was a really bad attitude to have, but it was like, I've done all this work over the last four years. I've tried to get my playing to a point where I, I'm proud of it. And I think I'm doing well, but if like, if I audition at these schools and no one lets me in, I'm going to take it as a sign and like go and pursue another route. So Um, which were the schools? Which ones were you auditioning um, for? Gosh, I it's it's hard to remember, but I know I auditioned for like a couple schools in London. Oh. Um, and I auditioned for well, I ended up going to Manus, and um, I I really wanted to study with Tim Eddy at Manus, and I was sort of he's a really great teacher, a really well known pedagogue, and I was like really um, nervous about playing for him. I took a lesson with him before I auditioned, and um, so I ended up getting into his studio at Manus and I was like, at that point it was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do because, um, I wanted to move to a big city. Like I, I think I auditioned at like Rice and like Eastman and I was kind of like, those are great schools, but I'm not sure if I want to end up being in those places after I'm done with my master. So I mm-hmm. went, I went with New York. Where were you and- before that? Oh, I was in Boston. Okay. Boston University. Yeah. So, Which is still a big city, but you, yeah. did you not want to stay in Boston? Um, it wasn't that I didn't want to stay in Boston, but I um, when I remember when I went to, to New York for my Manus audition, I was like, oh my God, this city is so cool. I really want to live here. Yeah. And that was the first time I really felt like that. Um, so... So it was really in my master's, which is only two years, which goes by so fast, but my teacher, Tim Eddy, was like, you need to figure out what you want to do. And the sooner you can figure that out, the sooner you can start working towards that specifically. Like, figure out what you want to do and, and just do that. Like, don't get sidetracked with what you think you should be doing or what other people are telling you that you should do. Like, figure out what you want to do and just every single thing that you do, every activity, every single move that you make in your career should be in service of that goal. And I was so thankful for him because I realized when he sort of prompted me um, that I wanted to do chamber music, that I'd always loved playing chamber music. It was always my favorite thing. Orchestra is awesome, but it never like sort of excited me the way that chamber music did. Mm-hmm. I, I also never really harbored designs on being a soloist. So I kind of knew that that wasn't where I wanted to go. Um, and so, yeah, because he told me like, focus on this, I did. And I focused on chamber music and I started chamber groups right out of school. And, um, I just kind of like really, really focused on doing that. And, um, you know, here I am 10 years later and I'm playing pretty much chamber music for a living. So it, it, it really was, was him telling me to like 
get my head straight that (laughs) set me on this path. So I'm so thankful to him. That's such great advice. So basically it was like, you decide now, like, are you going the audition route? Are you, you know, pick something and just go for it. Mm -hmm. That's great. And you know, a lot of times students don't feel like they, they know, and they, they're afraid to make a statement, like a decision like that. But I, I think in the worst case scenario, just pick something. And even if it changes later, at least you've been working towards something instead of staying in that I don't know place. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's not lost. Like the work that you've done isn't lost. Like if you learned all your excerpts and didn't end up going the orchestra route, you still like got that time in on your instrument and you're still, you know, better for it. But exactly. um, Yeah. For me, I took like one maybe two orchestra auditions it did not advance in either of them I was like okay cool I'm good on this and (laughs) um yeah that was that was it yeah so I imagine um I mean it must be so hard living in New York I mean there's so many musicians um what are some of the challenges of of being a musician in New York um you know maybe maybe some of the challenges that were for you for you starting out and then just generally being a New York musician? (laughs) There's so many challenges. It's hard to know (laughs) where to begin. Um, I mean, getting work is, is the challenge at the beginning and the middle and the end. Yeah. I still have to hustle, you know, to get work. I've been here for so many years and I know so many people, but I have to constantly be kind of, you know, managing my connections Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, expressing desire to work and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I remember at the very, very beginning, um, when I was, I think probably still in my master's degree, I literally printed out signs that said like, like my name and my website and like cello lessons available and like put them up in every school around where I lived. Mm. And I, that didn't work at all. I didn't get any phone calls from that. Um, but you know, I was just like, I was like, I gotta, I gotta figure this out. I remember I graduated from Manus with my master's in the summer of 2006. And I went to a two month long music festival, Taos music festival in New Mexico that summer. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go do this music festival and then I'm going to come back to the city. I have no idea what I'm going to do for work. Like I had nothing lined up. Mm. I just, I didn't know. Um, and I had applied before, before I had gone off for the summer, I had applied for, um, this teaching job at a community music school. And for whatever reason, they were a little slow to get back to me and they didn't call me until like months later. Um, while I was at Taos, like as it was like in the last month of this music festival and I was going to go back to New York, um, and try to figure out my life. And they called me and they said, okay, we want to hire you. And I just remember that feeling of like, somebody wants to hire me. This is amazing. I was so (laughs) excited. They hired me to like teach, um, group cello lessons in a public school two mornings a week and then do private cello lessons at their their, it was a community music school, their music school one day a week. And I was just over the moon. Like somebody has given me a job. This is incredible. Um, it was really hard. Like they gave me, um, like these students that had never seen a cello before. They didn't have any musical training. They just said like, here you go, have at it. Um, (laughs) it was a really, really hard job to do, but it was my first job. And, um, I'm so thankful that I was able to get to something and that gave yeah. me a little bit of structure. And from there I sort of built up, um, you know, in the beginning it was a lot of teaching. I built up some private students and another school and, you know, just kind of building up my schedule, starting a chamber group, doing gigs, like just kind of, just kind of starting out and trying to do as much as I could. Um, yeah. and over time, like the teaching kind of the pendulum sort of swung so that my teaching started to I get, get less and less. Mm-hmm. Um, and the performing stuff started to get more and more and actually become lucrative um, to where I am now, where I actually don't teach at all anymore. And I actually kind of wish that I did now. I think I might swing back the other way. Um, but 
but yeah, it was just this really sort of slow process and trying to make the most of every connection and trying to just build up my network and it takes forever. (laughs) It takes so long. (laughs) So that sounds like what you would tell people coming out of Juilliard and all these other schools in New York, if they're getting started, just start slow, I guess. Right. Yeah. And like, there is a time, like the, the really, really hard thing besides just getting work to come in and getting offers, Mm -hmm. um, is knowing when to say yes and when to say no. And I, I think honestly, I'm still working this out. Like my, I'm like a, maybe a workaholic. And so my instinct is always say yes. If if it's in the schedule, do it. But I'm learning, um, very slowly that sometimes it's better just to say no. And now like if a gig comes in and it's, it doesn't pay enough to justify the time or the effort, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm able to say no. And, you know, it's like, you can do that. But I would say even closer to the beginning, don't just say yes to absolutely everything. Um, especially if it's unpaid, okay. unpaid work. Is That's what really I was going to ask you. Unpaid work. I mean, I've, I've done it and I still do it if it's a very specific circumstance, but unpaid work is a very, very slippery slope. Yes. Because if you do something for free once, there's nothing to prevent that person from asking you to do something for free again and to start to feel that that's, that they can get you to work for free at any time that they need. Yeah. Um, and then, then maybe they recommend you to their friend who needs somebody to do, do that, them a favor. And then you just end up getting into this cycle where like, wait a second, <laughs> I'm doing all this work and I'm not getting paid for it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And actually I was talking to somebody who graduated a few years ago from Juilliard and he told me that, that, it's really common for young musicians graduating from Juilliard and Manus and Manhattan School and all these places. They're just, they, you know, it's like you're released into the wild after school mm-hmm. and you're in New York. And he said so many musicians play for free. And I'm like, absolutely. Yeah. I was like, absolutely not. They should not do that. And he's like, they do. And, and it's almost like they feel like they can't say no because other people are doing it. Like they're kind of trapped. Yeah. So. yeah and, you know, I mean, I'm thankfully not part of that world anymore. Right. Like, You're I a veteran now. You've been there for a long time. Yeah. Like, I'm not, I don't get approached to do free work often, although it still occasionally happens. Or, like, you know, can you come and do this gig and we're going to pay you $50 or something, you know. Right. Stuff that's essentially free anyway. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a very scary thing to realize that, like, if you don't do something, there's always someone who will do it. Yeah. Like no matter how much it pays, no matter how little it pays, there's always somebody who's hungry for work who will do it. And you have to be kind of just okay with it. Yeah. And accept that like, like for me, I know my threshold of what I can like reasonably stomach doing and for how much money. And yeah. You just kind of have to accept it. But but like I said, I, th- I really think working for free or working for way under what you should be is a very, very slippery slope because you end up in this cycle of that type of work and it's hard to, to break out of it. So I would definitely suggest like know your value right away um, and make sure that what you do offer is a good value. Like don't show up at gigs unprepared. Don't show up late. You know, I mean, it's just like basic stuff, but I'm still pretty astounded um, even now at sometimes what I see in in people kind of not doing their best or putting their best foot forward at every single gig. Mm. But it's like if you're going to if you're going to expect to be paid and be compensated for what you think you're worth, make it worth the person's while who's hiring you, you know, give your best at everything. That's very good advice. But yeah, I think, I think as you, as you get older, you start to, everyone starts to say, hmm, what am I willing to do for that amount of money? You know, yeah, like totally. if this, it might sound like a lot of money on paper, but then you go, wait a second, I'm going to be gone from 8 a.m. until 11 p.m. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. for that amount of money, there's no time to go anywhere in between or whatever. So yeah, you kind of start to see what you what you're worth and stick to that. But but the the flip side of that, make sure that what you're bringing to the table is worth what they're paying too. Yes. you're showing up with, you know, sounding good, prepared early, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm always surprised when people come in the last minute. You're like, didn't you learn that like 20 minutes early is still kind of (laughs) late, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Basic. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. Well, that that's really great advice because I, I can't imagine even right now, I can't imagine moving to New York City and trying to get or any big city for that matter and trying to get started in the in a freelance scene because you're new. I mean, you have to you have yeah. to convince people that to even see you there, you know? Yeah. And, you know, another another really great piece of advice that um, Tim Eddy, my teacher, gave to me was like, make sure people hear you play on a regular basis and um, it, like solo, like by yourself, make mm-hmm. sure people hear what you sound like. Um, and that kind of goes against like the free gig thing. Cause like sometimes you get an opportunity to play something solo. Um, and it not, might not pay as much as you would expect, but, um, the opportunity to like have your, your voice be heard by people and by colleagues and by other potential people that will hire you is really, really important. So make sure you're playing out and performing as much as possible because, um, you know, that can be a really, really good way of keeping yourself relevant and keeping, you know, keep generating work for yourself. Absolutely. I, when I was in Chicago starting out, I felt the same way. Like I'm, I just would ask people to play for them, you know, Hey, I'm getting ready for an audition. Do you mind if I play some, some of my excerpts for you or something? Yeah, so, totally. so people can hear you. They don't, if, if you're new, they don't know you. And if they don't know you and they don't know you're playing, how are they expected to, to trust that they're, you're a good name to recommend to somebody. But Absolutely. yeah, I think that's really great advice. Go ahead and play for people. And people are always, I know if, if anyone asks me if they can play for me, I'm always like, of course, anytime, you know? So, so yeah, don't be afraid to do that. That's great advice too. Totally. So, um, thank you so much for being on today. I, I just want, I just have one more question. Um, do you have anything you want to promote, um, coming up? Um, I mean, if you're in New York, we would love to see you at Gather NYC. It's every, every Sunday. And, um, if you're not in New York, you probably know someone who lives in New York. So yeah. <laughs> please tell them. Um, yeah, we're just trying to spread the word. And it's a very sort of slow grassroots effort. So anyone who's listening, please, please check us out. Yes. Follow on Facebook. Your your posts are great. They're always, they're always very informative and great photos of the people that are coming. So, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you Thank so much you, for Tracy. being on. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.